right down the eye, bud. Oi. hours of this morning, that's British time, the body of Bob Marley was laid to rest in a mausoleum in his birthplace, St Anne's, in the north of Jamaica. He was just 36 when he died of cancer 11 days ago. Thousands of Jamaicans lined the streets to watch it pass, and it was a remarkable climax to what was surely the most extraordinary funeral ever given to a pop singer. But then Bob Marley was no ordinary pop singer, as Robin Denslow reports. It's been a peaceful funeral demonstration so far, but suddenly the police are tear gassing the crowd, but we don't yet know why. Tear gas exploding up behind me now. He might not have been surprised, but there was a little trouble, even at his funeral. As he said to me, it's not we against the system, it's the system against we. You know, hated violence. Oh, it's Rastas believe in peace and love. We'd use the pen as the sword. The police was carrying Bob Marley's coffin out of the stadium. Uh, it was quite amazing because, I mean, you know, he would never have uh, tolerated anything like that. That's why I stayed away, because I didn't want to be in a carnival. You see, I didn't want to be at a funeral where his children are jumping up and down on the stage, dancing and all this kind of thing. And it's supposed to be your father's funeral. He had become a commodity, even in death. That's Bob Eamon's desire, to see everybody live in peace and harmony in this world. Because that's what let the world go round, you know, love. So You can't solve a problem with a war, you know. It doesn't really solve a problem. You don't know, feel like really killing someone. But whose problem am I going to solve when I kill someone? You know what I mean? So I figure the peace is the best thing. From unknown trench down Rasta to one of the world's most influential artists, Bob Marley was a musical prophet and Rasta warrior who fought oppression and injustice with his six string guitar. He took the pulsating power of reggae music and tied its vibration to universal anthems of justice and unity. As the undisputed sovereign of reggae, Bob Marley's revolutionary music has and continues to have a massive impact on people of all races throughout the world. The music follows you wherever you go. Lots of grown-ups say to me, you know, when I put on a Bob Marley record and I'm feeling depressed and I put it on in the mornings, I feel so much better. I think it will continue, honestly, forever, in a sense. I think that he will be, his music will be around forever. I think we didn't see a fraction of what he could have done. He didn't even have 10 years at the top, you know, that's nothing. Beat the 
There are so many contradictions about Bob Marley's early life that it is difficult to know what to believe. Strip away the beautification of an icon and you're still left with half-truths, myths and untruths. Jamaica was just awakening to freedom after three centuries of British colonial rule when Robert Nesta Marley was born in a tiny rural shack to 19-year-old Sadella Malcolm and Captain Norval Sinclair Marley. He was an Englishman, a white man. His work was doing um, field work in the mountain as a supervisor for the ex soldier He was well liked here. Well, Bob's mum, she was from like, a poor family in Jamaica. Uh, his dad was from a rich family, like old school, white Jamaican family, and he left her the day after they get, got married, apparently. I wouldn't want to really say on camera what he said about his father, but... Slavery was a very painful thing. The white landowners abused women, and, and women were just there, African women are there for their pleasure, and whether they marry or not marry, they have a child, and, and then they take no responsibility, and then they go away, and so... It's all in the past, it does not, it's not important, but, you know, out of all of this pain, you know, out of all of the mess, a rose can grow. He didn't know his earthly father, but he knew the Almighty so much. Bob was a man that he took personally, like God was his dad. The way they used to be. Don't tell no lie. One and all got to face reality. Bob Marley's exact birth date may never truly be known. His passport, issued in 1964, lists his birth date as April the 6th, 1945. But searches by Jamaican archivists have yet to produce a birth certificate. His Rastafarian brethren greet this news with a sage nod, believing that Marley, like Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, was never born and therefore could not die. Bob Marley was a poet. He's not a prophet, he's not a saint, he's not, he's a human being. He would be very embarrassed by all this prophet saint rubbish that they're trying to put on him and all of this stuff. He did want a better world and if he thought he could do that, he would go to great lengths. That's why he did stand on stage with a gun wound, put himself in a position where he could very well have been shot. If that makes him a saint, because if he had been shot, then it would have been Saint Bob, wouldn't it? I mean. <laughs> The real Saint Bob. People believe that Bob was a prophet. I know Bob was a messenger. I won't stress his head about he's a prophet. One good thing about music when it hits the at the age of five, Bob moved with his mother to Kingston, where Sadella thought that they would have a greater chance of improving their lives. Well, Bob told me about his childhood in the sense of he was a little boy that suffered, but then most black children born in poverty are going to suffer. His childhood was not, you know, a cloistered happy, conventional childhood. It was a street childhood and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. His mother, she was gone when he was very young. He said she left and went to America, but she did send for him and he did try there, but of course it was no good for him. And he returned to Jamaica, which is a good thing. But at the same time, there was happiness. He had happy times with his grandfather when he would go the fields on the donkey and help dig yams and things like that. So he had great memories of his grandfather. That's Bob's house, right? Bob's used to be living over there a long time now, about 16, 17 years old. Bob would eat out of the um, calabash and so forth. He would not eat out of any other plate or utensil. And he would live in on a single bed inside this room here. Sadella took Bob to live with the Livingston family, 
and it was here that Bob and his newfound friend, Bunny Livingston, began to experiment with music. Bonnie, father, was living with Bob, mother, they was like man and woman, you see? So Bob come into the house where mother was living with Bonnie. So my and Bonnie was really good, good friend. You see? So my understanding that trench town, people were singing every day, people was making music, and all these things was happening. But you see, Bob was very different from most of the musicians that were in town. You see, Bob had a part of the country in his life already, which in most of the musicians in the town, they haven't been to country, they don't know what is about. All his aim, his desire was in music, nothing else, you know, nothing else really that he was interested in. Besides, you know, music, that was his main thing. Bob finished school at 16, and Peter and all of them, very young age, they did not go on to further education. They did not have time to read books to enhance their um, vocabulary anymore. So they were just, he, he was very interested in world affairs. He'd read the papers every morning, and so he was very much tuned into how the world was going, but that doesn't mean that he was an intellectual. He was more educated from the street. He really learnt what he needed to learn. You know, inspiration instead of education is how he liked to put it. He was hanging out with, you know, the gangs, what later became known as rude boys. He, he was playing football on the street, hanging out on the street, hearing music on the street. I mean, that's his, most of his education came from there. Bob took his first job as an apprentice welder. However, after an accident that filled his right eye with metal, he became determined to make it as a singer. Bob and Bunny, along with another teenager, Peter McIntosh, formed the Wailing Rude Boys, who later became known as the Wailers. Their first song, Simmer Down, was an instant number one in Jamaica. Early Wailers songs were based on the popular dance music style of ska. Over time, the Wailers slowed down the beat, preferring the slower, bass-heavy sound of reggae. had Scar, first of all, which was quite up, frantic, but then it was about mid-60s and it was really hot and Scar proved to be a little bit too energetic to leap about to, so it kind of slowed down and it turned into Rocksteady, which um, was like the link between Scar and what became known as Roots Reggae, which is when it really got slow and I think that's when like the ganja was kicking in as well and um, it was kind of a slow evolution. The very soul of reggae music was from the Grau Nation ceremonies, which the Rastafarians used to just chant. They call it Rastafarian hymns. They sing these old songs over drumming. There'd be like, like 20 drummers just playing this kind of heartbeat. It was based on a heartbeat. They'd be chanting away like this and listening to American R&B, like popular US hits of the day. Somewhere along the line, the two combined. But it, reggae was a very slowly evolving thing. Bob Marley started to understand the scare days, ching, ching, and then go to the rock steady, you know, and then the record cheat, slow down, yeah? And it's like, you play reggae music in Jamaica those days, it's like, you call in the police because reggae music starts to play about a lot of Rasta people. A lot of people say it's devil music and you, you can't play reggae music. The other change was more spiritual than musical. After the 1966 state visit of Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie to Jamaica, the Whalers became deeply involved in the Rastafarian movement. Bob and the Rasta elders prophesied that Jesus would come again, but in another name. He believed that the powers of the West were being deceived by looking for the Redeemer in the name of Jesus. That first night we met. Bless me, Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie. 
Ja Rastafari, who live and reign it with I and I, I continually ever faithful, ever sure. Ja Rastafari, with no apology. And this is the Rastaman vibration. <laughs> Rasta is something from the heart. Rastafari is not like a religion, it's like more like a concept for the people, something to believe in. Growing up as a Rasta, when the parents say, go and cut it, trim it, yeah, boy, you know, it was a problem. <laughs> See, because everybody's supposed to look like American, Jerry Curl, and, you know, most Jamaican people are slaves, like, come from Africa as slaves. So, you find the Rasta people, well, it was more like the underprivileged, you know. Rasta was really, well, like a burden to the society. The policeman in Jamaica now, well, uh, they, there was more racism with them. <laughs> you see, because if you're a Rasta, you talk about Rasta and a policeman catch you, you're going to jail. The police gave us a hard time. There was roadblocks everywhere. It was very, very difficult. Um, Taxis wouldn't stop for us. He'd say, Esther, you go and stand in the street and he'll stand for you. For example, his car would break down and, <laughs> and things like that and he can't get it fixed. And so it was really very odd. Rastafarianism is very popular in Jamaica, yet in Canada and the United States it has a bad reputation. People are associated with drugs and the trafficking of marijuana and violence, police yeah, arrest. Man, them crucified Christ, remember? Christ was a Christian and him crucify Christ, say him is not a, what no, it is. No, but let's go back to the facts. People have been arrested and the Rastafarians in Toronto, for example, have but a I mean, very bad reputation. When I, I mean, you know, I would say, I wouldn't say that the Rastafarians have a bad reputation. I would say people give the Rastafarians bad reputation because the Rastafarians, I mean, you know, I mean, all of these things happening before the Rastafarians even start coming to Canada anyway around here. But, but the things that are very obvious are things like the way you look, Right? To most people who are very conservative in dress, you look quite strange. Plus the fact that you advocate smoking yeah, marijuana. Yeah, you think this. I'll show you this now. Could they tell God that it's not legal? No, but you're... They couldn't tell God that, have, that it's not legal. You have a legal. very strong religious belief, but other people don't necessarily share that. And what they see are the obvious things. And isn't it, in fact, true that many Jamaican people get involved in the trafficking of marijuana and therefore get the bad reputation associated with Rastafarians? People get trafficking. You see, we're really, I don't really know anything about those parts of life. You know, All I know about is Rastafari, you know, and try bringing this truth to the people. What do people do with them life? I don't really know about that. I know about my own. Music producer Lee Perry was Jamaica's answer to Phil Spector. In 1969, he recorded a series of sessions with the Whalers. Perry, believing the masters to be his, took them to London and sold them. For 10 years, he said they worked and worked and worked and never had a penny. All their music was pirated. Lee Perry had already been quite successful in his own right. He already had a reputation as a nutcase. <laughs> it was traditional that the producer took all the money and the artist basically got a pittance. And this happened with the Whalers for some years. They had to go through what every every artist in Jamaica has to go through, which is getting ripped off stupid. <laughs> the Whalers were furious, but ironically it was this betrayal which brought them to the attention of Esther Anderson and her partner Chris Blackwell of Island Records. When I came to England and studied acting at the Actors' Workshop, when I finished drama school, I, I did all the, th the usual things, like Dixon of Dark Green, the same, I mean, no Danger Man, um, The Avengers, you know, all these kind of work that was available for black people, which was not a lot at the time. Eventually did a film with Sidney Poitier, which won the Image Award for me and gave me an Oscar nomination. And I grew up in England, struggling to actually express myself because there wasn't that much work. But Alongside that, I was helping to introduce our music here through Island Records and my partner, 
um, to bring our people, bring out the music from Jamaica. We started Island Records here in England. It seemed at the time an impossible sort of dream, but between my partner and myself, it was just a little mini, we went from record shop to record shop and I would go and I would um, bombard everybody with the records. We started out like that and eventually people started buying the records. It was always on a sale and return basis, so it was 25 years it took. We worked very hard and uh, we achieved our goals. I mean, we were one of the first independent labels. So it was kind of like a revolution that took place and gave the industry, you know, something that the young people, young musicians could then take control of their lives and be freer to express themselves. What Bob was losing out financially, he was gaining in finding his feet, studio experience, and then Chris Blackwell noticing and signing him up. And it has to be taken into account that when Blackwell signed him, Ireland was not a reggae label, it was, reggae was not popular. I known Jimi Hendrix, right? And Bob reminded me of Hendrix. But I knew with Bob and the Whalers, not Bob alone, but Bob and the Whalers, the Whalers as a group, strong. I could see once I heard Concrete Jungle and um, Slave Driver, that was it. I was totally committed. By 1973, the Whalers had cracked Jamaica. Now it was time for them to take on the world. They were signed to Island Records and for the first time, a reggae band had access to the best recording facilities. the Caribbean and I photographed him all the time. We developed a very close relationship where we started to write together. Bob was very beautiful to, to look at, to photograph. He was just what the white world wanted. They can't, they, they would not accept Peter Tosh who was very, very bright also because he was too black. They never let Jimmy Cliff through because he was too black. But um, Bob, as the person leading the group, could go through and pull all the others through, and he could be the voice for, for them. Bob really wanted to get his voice out, to really stand as an example for liberation. The first album released with Ireland was 1973's Catch a Fire. When Ireland released the first album, Catch a Fire, with the zipper lighter, for about a year and a half, it, would not, it didn't sell. I mean, it's, it didn't even sell enough to cover the recording session. And so basically, I knew that I had the answer. I said to him, if you smoke, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. It is part of your culture. My approach was to photograph Bob in the light that we have in Jamaica, showing the color of our skin the way it should be shown. And I took his shirt off because he has a lovely color. And once the light hit his skin and bounced back onto my lens, that was it. Catch a Fire was re-released with a new cover shot by Esther. That was such a controversial record in America because it was banned, and because it was banned, it became a huge hit. Bob's songs were parables, messages of faith and warning. He never ceased to speak out against the oppressors using his influence to highlight the exploitation of the black race. His lyrics reflected the plight of the demoralized people of Jamaica, seeking escape from the slums. The way Jamaica is, you have one television station at those days, yeah? And most people listen to the radio, or you buy the paper. Some people couldn't afford the paper. So a lot of people can get the message where they want to hear through the music. If you go to Jamaica and you look around, you can see what Bob talking about. You see, you don't 
have to guess. It's not like a dream. It just, it's not, you know, some people write and they write like fairy tears. You have to check the Bob because a poet also, you know. At times he called me a slave driver because I was always pushing him to write. And he said, come on, let's write a song. And so basically I encouraged him to take his guitar with us everywhere we go. And so we would um, go on the island, so he'd bring his guitar and he'd do the reggae rhythm and the song would be born. It wasn't very hard to write songs because it was what was happening around us. The songs Bob sang, they were, yeah, logic and common sense. He was strong to his cause. We developed a very close relationship where we started to write together, and we wrote Get Up, Stand Up, Flying Over Haiti, a country which had experienced the most awful poverty and the most awful pain uh, with slavery. We just wrote it there on the plane, on the paper, and just start talking, and he'd beat out a little rhythm on the seat of the plane, and that would be it. He wrote some great pop songs with catchy choruses that you can sing. Right, that's the surface level. On an emotional level, and especially a groove level, the Whalers were an incredible band. Bob was an incredibly passionate singer, and these are things that strike an emotional chord no matter what style of music you're in, into. I mean, you can hate reggae and love Bob Marley, you know, it's just universal, and he's got a universal message. It was a, it's positive. Lord, I gotta keep on Revolution and the struggle was using the pen to speak for us and using the music to drive that the lyrics to put the thing out so that all people could identify it, that it could become universal and really cross over. So I encourage him to write more protest songs rather than love songs. Bob managed to have like these different personalities. I mean, it, the same album, he could be doing a song about war, really brutal, graphic, realistic song. And then he'll be singing Waiting in Vain, or Is This Love? You know, he just was able to translate whatever was going on in his head. It just came out and it was always sounding like Bob. And he never sold out, got soppy or soft or anything like that. It was all part of him. Just He, he wasn't ever going to be just a relentless militant what is your own? What's your music my own to you? Is my own, my, the music to me, the music is more than music to me. It go further than music, you know. It go with, with I don't know it further than music. But you used it as a, a strong message. I mean, words like a hungry man music is an angry me. man. Yeah, the music used me. Whatever it is, there's no doubt Bob Marley knows how to use his music. 12,000 people, more than half of them white, came to hear him perform. And in a trance-like mystical state, he carried them with him and left them shouting for more. Despite this obvious commercial success, he appears to live the life he preaches. But as Bob's fame amplified, so did the media pressure. He wasn't the god polite figure that he is now, but he was certainly one of the most famous men in the world. People started coming from Harvard, Oxford University, Cambridge, and so to investigate the whole, what was going on in Jamaica. Um, I coach them. I just say to Bob, now, you just have to be yourself, be strong, speak with your own dialect, the way you speak. Don't try to, you know, articulate for them the way they want to do it. All the reporters had to come through me and Bob Rose was then free to be himself, to speak in his own, uh, way to articulate the way he articulate and for Jamaicans not to be ashamed of their accent. He didn't get a good time from the press. I asked him about this and said, you know, why? You're always getting slagged off. Why are you sitting there talking to me now? And he just said, um, you know, comes with the territory. I've got to keep going out there and playing and trying to make myself better. The first tour we went to America, but still people were calling him, uh, you know, talking about, oh, 
weird hair and savages or whatever. I asked him too if he ever got sick of trotting out the same set every night. His shows have been slagged off for going through the motions. I mean, if you've ever seen any footage of Bob Marley, you know he's no way going through the motions. I mean, he, he gets carried away and he was going to another place in himself every night. He was up there with the rock idol. You know, he could play in Los Angeles and the, the front tables would be the Stones and, you know, the rock royalty come to check him out. And not put off by the fact that he was a ghettoized reggae artist. By 1974, the Whalers had fallen apart. Let me tell you this, I'm a dopey conqueror, conqueror. I think the Whalers split up because Bob was getting all the attention. Um, that's Tosh. I mean, he, Tosh wanted to be Bob. He was very, very upset because he didn't want to be a front man. He didn't want a front. He just wanted to just help to do the work and get the message out. So I encouraged him to just reform. And so he went back and uh, he got himself a manager and the manager renegotiated a new contract. And then they became Bob Marley and the Whalers. So the Whalers could be anyone after that. But basically with Family Man and Carly driving the, the rhythm section. Although they broke up, and it was a very sad time because Peter and Bob were like John Lennon and Paul McCartney together. However, Bob Marley's star was on the rise. Now that he had become an international celebrity, politicians sought to use him as a pawn in their power games. Jamaica's rival parties were both keen to conscript him because he had street credibility. He was not just a Jamaican singer, he was an international singer because the message that he carried was the message of third world people all over the world. In doing so, of course, he helped to put Jamaican music on the map internationally. He's also very significant, I think, because he's one of those rare figures that come along perhaps once in a generation who, by some chemistry of themselves, their own genius, takes what is up to then just a folk form and makes, makes it a part of the universal art of the world. But Bob Marley wanted nothing to do with party politics. Yet when he was approached by the then Jamaican Prime Minister, Michael Manley, offering to stage a free concert, he agreed. On the night of the 25th of November, 1976, assassins crept into Bob Marley's home and opened fire. I picked up the newspaper and I couldn't believe it. He said, Bob Marley shot. Five gunmen came in and splattered the room. I got him on the phone in Nassau, and he started to tell me in detail what had happened, how they'd come in, these men, and, and shot up the, the house, and him, and the, the musicians, and his manager. And It was never, you know, found out by the police who did it, but, like I say, it's a popular theory that it was organised by the same guy, Siegel, who when Bob died, got a posthumous uh, Jamaican equivalent of the knighthood or whatever. <laughs> no, they tried to kill him, of course. Politician, very dangerous, you know. Politics is life and death, you know. Very selfish. To be a president in Jamaica, you have to be corrupted. Uh, any kind of politician, you have to be corrupted. I would believe that, that <laughs> Bob Marley was shot by a politician, you know. He came to England and then he acted out everything. He, he acted it out and showed me where the bullet was in his arm because he still had a bullet in his, in, in his hand. And he made me write it down. He made me, he said, you've got to write it all down. Anyway, he survived and he did the show. He still went back and he did the, the concert. And some people say it was political. Some people say it had something to do with some of his friends who had attached themselves to him. He did the gig wearing a bandage and I think it was Rita Marley got shot in the head. She did the gig in a nighty with a bandage on, on a red. Um, a lot of the bands pulled out. Bob, I mean, fair play, he could have just walked on stage and been machine gunned down. You know, I mean, that, that really took a bit of courage to do that. But, you know, he stood there, the famous picture where he's got the two leaders and he's bringing their hands together. I mean, 
he was a sitting target there. I'm surprised he got away that lightly. Bob's status had increasingly attracted those seeking to exploit his popularity for their gain. His refusal to be controlled by others had almost cost him his life. Did you see him as a political figure in any way? There was an assassination attempt on him just before he was to give a concert which some people saw as being a sign of support for you in the election before last. Yes. The um, political figure, yes, political figure, no. Political figure, no, in the sense that Bob was not by temperament or mind the kind of person who would ever become, say, a part of a party. Bob wasn't at that length, at that level or in that wavelength at all. Political, yes, in that he was one of the most articulate troubadours of the ghetto, its suffering, its pressures that I have ever, ever heard. Ghetto youth, tired of the constant political infighting, banded together in a mammoth reggae concert for peace. It ended with Prime Minister Michael Manley and opposition leader Edward Sayaga on stage shaking hands in an appeal for peace. The man responsible for it all, they say, was Bob Marley. But isn't what you need some sort of social legislative change? The economic conditions are bad. You have a lot of people who are unemployed. What's really going on now is that we don't really want the island to change. We want the world to change. And his music is how he gets his message across. After the attempt on his life, Bob Marley exiled himself to London for 18 months. After the shooting, first of all, he took off to the Bahamas and then he, he came to London, spent 18 months um, living in Chelsea, recording Exodus. We wrote, I shot, shot the sheriff in this flat and, uh, and, and finished Get Up, Stand Up also here. And from here we did all the work for him to go into the recording. I cook for them and take it. To, so the place has got memories. He adapted very easily to what was going on in Britain because, I mean, he, he chose to live in London when the punk thing was exploding. Mick just lived down the road here and Bianca and Marion and all of us were all very close. I introduced Bob to Mick in the street down there and Bianca came up, rushed up, he, she came home and Mick was there. Esther just introduced me to a musician she just brought from Jamaica. Bianca ran up here and come to meet, meet uh, Bob and was just so Amazing, and uh, they actually came to the speakeasy to the gig and screamed. B Bianca was at the back screaming Rastafari and everything. It wasn't that he was the name that made him the person, you know. He was a person before the name, you know, he's a strong person. It's not a person you would say, who's that over there? You would know that there's someone over there who is like a strong person, you know. He had that kind of energy. Oh, Bob. If you wanted to work, he's ready to work. Of course, he was a disciplinarian. If something was wrong, he would have a go. At the studio of BBC, there was a young show-off lady, and she was behaving very bad. This is where I learned from Bob Marley. The lady was smoking a cigarette in the electrical part around the back. A old man came and said, could you hold the cigarette? The lady told him, you know, very bad words, where to go. I just heard Bob come and tell her off, in the right way, you know. He asked her, is it your name on this or is it my name, you know, properly. And I felt embarrassed for her, you see, and I walked off. And I know that he's a man, you know, because that lady was a very show-off lady, she, you know, because I'm little me, I was little, you know, a 17-year-old raster, so, you know, she don't see you, but Bob Marley see everybody, you know, yeah. He was good like that. I think Bob was single-minded into the music. He wanted his family around him. When I say family, his extended family of musicians, a complex network of female company. Miss World was living in the house and she said, what are your big famous movie star doing with a boy like that? So, <laughs> but um, I said, one day you'll all see, you know, and anyway, she ended up as Miss, Mrs. Marley or whatever. <laughs> the women used to chase that man because, as I say, of his aura. He was a man 
who love women and they'd come to heat him up. He never go running after them, but like all rock stars, he, you know, he attract girls. While in London, Bob heard the clash for the first time. He admired their courage and anger in the face of England's class-based economic oppression and identified with their fight against racism and the system. Bob came to realize that there were a lot of similarities between the, the punks and the young black kids in London who were getting stopped by the police. And there were a lot of similarities to, between, you know, his kids he knew back home in Trenchtown. Bob started off taking the mickey, but he ended up doing a record called Punky Reggae Party, which, you know, name checks the clash. He fitted like a glove and they, he was playing football and there was a lot of, um, you know, regular football matches going on through 1977, including one with The Clash, I believe. <laughs> we used to play, link up with Bob Marley and play football and stuff like that in the team. Make a team and, you know, go out as the Whalers and play football and, you know, do quite good, you know. Never got thrashed, really, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know, I think the Whalers slaughtered the clash, but um, and they were a good team. Could read the game, we call it. Could read the game. Strong. Very little short man. Strong. I asked him if, if he'd ever considered being a footballer as opposed to a musician, and he said never, because he, music's in his soul and... He made a point of saying football's too rough. He used to like to play football, which I totally disapproved of because I used to say, you should be, you know, you're not a football player. And, and so he had this friend who used to encourage him to go off to play this football. And I said, but people are waiting on you. you. You have to go on tour and you should be rehearsing and writing songs. But he liked the football. And of course, that's what damaged his toe that then became malignant and created all this cancer, cancer cells in his body that uh, took him over eventually. In, was it May 77, Bob sustained the football injury which um, would become the cancer. And um, it was Bob's passion for football which really, he kept playing. You know, he didn't stop in May 1977, he was still playing in 1980, you know, which is a bit silly really. <laughs> By the late 1970s, Bob Marley had catapulted from the hottest new celebrity in black music to global superstar. He had become a world figurehead, like a Jamaican Martin Luther King. His records sold millions. His tours sold out, and from Asia to America, from Africa to Europe, he sang the message of Ja. Despite his fame, he never lost touch with his own humanity. The interesting thing about him is that as he grew in stature, as he became a millionaire, for example, one often wondered, will he tend to go soft, to become gimmicky, to try to appeal to a more commercial market by compromising his statement. And instead, he remained absolutely uncompromising. The range of his interests grew, said so he would sing of Zimbabwe as well as Trench Town in Jamaica. But the concern remained absolutely the same, uncompromisingly the same. The money didn't change Mr. Marley. I think that the, it changed the people around him. No matter how much money you may have, uh, you're going to leave it anyway. So. <laughs> He's not somebody that really worshipped money and things like that, or fame. I remember once he, he took the uh, pair of jeans out of the washing machine and had lots of fibers. All in, and he didn't even know that his trousers pocket was got all this money in it. And just, well, you know, it didn't, it didn't even matter to him. But yet he never had any money either. And in, in, in a way, when he was sick, he kind of lived in some sort of terrible poverty. What do you do with the money that you make? Do you take it back to Jamaica? Do you give it to the people? I give it away. You give all your money away? All the time, yeah. How do you survive? Oh, Rastafari is God. How do you feel the people of Jamaica see you as a musician? See me, the people of Jamaica now see me. We show the people of Jamaica Rastafari. No, no, no. Do they like you? If the people like me, yeah, the people love I. 
people love her, the people who make her. The influence which our father has on music is that he brings the people vibes to the world and to use music not only for make money or entertain but for educate and enlighten people. He said, Mama, the doctor said I have cancer in my leg and maybe they have to cut it off. I couldn't believe, you know. I said, what? He said, yes, but he said, why would you give me cancer? I never do anybody any wrong. I never do anything that is wrong. What is it? Why? So I didn't really have the answer for that. I could only say, who ja love it? He chastise it. So, you know, whatever comes, we have to just, we have to just face what is before us. He was limping, you know, he was hopping away on his, on his bandaged foot. And um, obviously the first thing I said was, oh, what you done there? And um, he laughed. And that is the nearest he got to, he was basically saying that, well, look, you know, my foot, it's hurt. He must have known he was seriously ill. But he didn't, it, it, he wasn't even putting a brave face on it. He was genuinely sitting there, really chilled out, watching the Olympics on the TV with the sound off. And he was just very, very content. I always remember his last words, though. He grabbed hold of my hand, looked me in the eye, and this massive grin that he had, with a little twinkling, warm grin. And he just said, everything cool. And that was it, you know. But just the way he said it, it was everything cool, you know. I heard that he passed away. You know, it was, was terrible. I was in Jamaica when it happened, and I phoned here in London, and, and I couldn't believe it. I was totally shocked. I mean, I would never have in a million years thought that he did that would be the last interview and a year later he'd be dead. I don't think he should have been made to do that last American tour because, you know, you've got photos of him in 77 with the bandage and he's, here he is in 1980 still wearing the bandage, which was basically a permanent fixture in that period. So um, I don't know why he was forced to do that last tour. I, I, he looked really knackered when I saw him. I think the kind of people he had around him, he was not advised properly. The record company should have taken better care of him. But there was nobody intervening for Bob, as far as I know. The friends that Bob had around him by then was a very dark energy. The, he had uh, some bad elements around him that um, was not helpful to his, his growth or helping him to really sort this problem out. And he was overworked, you could say, because he was touring very hard and he should have had a holiday. I just think that the, the people around him just didn't take any care and they know it and they know how I feel about it, especially one who knows exactly who he is and I'm talking to him now and I hope that he watched this documentary that he can see it. Because he had a big, big influence on Bob and so they could have done something more for him instead of these people out of I don't know where they came from uh, saying that they know how to cure cancer. And when it was too late, he goes to Germany and it was too late. The treatment in Bavaria wasn't recognised by the American Cancer Society at all. This was kind of renegade, you know, holistic treatment almost. And I think Bob was believing, you know, willing himself to believe that he was getting better. Absolutely not the right care for somebody with that kind of money at that point in his life. He wouldn't go with traditional Western medicine because of Rastafarian belief. So he was a deeply religious bloke. During his brief lifetime, Bob Marley had risen from the ghettos of Kingston to become one of the most influential and charismatic performers the world has ever seen. But what is so remarkable is how immensely powerful his music remains today, how undiminished his message is, and that it still resonates so deeply. I and I know words to really talk about Bob Marley for the good that he have done. 
he's really a prophet. No doubt about that. He was going to be a superstar, whatever. You know, he, he had that in him. He was strong to his cause, genuine, you know. I don't think that he would have thought of himself as any saint or any prophet or anything. He'd tell you to go away with that, you know. He just would not have uh, tolerated any of that. Bob's one of the most influential figures of the 20th century. If he hadn't have done what he did, the world would be a much poorer place. They have made him into a commodity. Now you can buy Bob Marley shoes on the internet or whatever it is, you know. Um, he would have just been sick. Spirit is spirit. And it's not something you can see or old, you know, but you just feel. I can always feel him, because right now he's here. My father mean to me just being a father, really, you know, and a teacher. But he's a teacher through actions more than words. Bob had a lot more to offer. Um, I think we only really saw the start of it. If he was still around now, I'd love to hear what he'd be doing. He's always with us, and uh, and the music is always there. <laughs> He's here to stay, really. I mean, would he have done Live Aid? You know, you can speculate, you can go on, you know, we like, but I think if he'd have had another few years even, you know, just a couple, I think we would have seen a lot more of another side of Bob. His music, he did it from his heart and from his experience, you know. The fact he'd gone back to Africa, which is like the big thing that Rastafarians wanted to do, Bob was in a position to do it, and he was not only in, in a position to do that, he could go back to Africa and make a difference there. I think we didn't see a fraction of what he could have done. Basically, listen was freedom and justice for all people, you know, especially for African people too. Freedom of Africa and justice of Africa. Yeah. Bob couldn't have lived to a nice old age and enjoy his children, his grandchildren, and and be around with us and still be jamming. As we say, one of these days I'm gonna stop playing music. I ain't gonna sing no song no more, you know. Just put the trumpet up, you know, see? But the trumpet is still blowing, Bob. <laughs> now, my name is... Nati Dre. Nati Dre. Positive vibration. Not the dread, positive vibration. Not the dread, positive vibration. Ja Rastafari. Ja Rastafari.